Hello. Before we begin, we wish to recognize that the New Mexico Museum of Art sits on unceded ancestral Tiwa land, specifically Agua Pregueguay, now present day Santa Fe. Even though the Tiwa land is no longer the thriving Pueblo village it once was, their descendants, the modern day Tiwa people, still exist and live in Santa Fe and the local Pueblos of Nambe, Coaque, San Ildefonso, Oke Awengue, Santa Clara, and Tezuque. Remembering and honoring place is one of the fundamental aspects of modern day Pueblo people. This is done through ceremonial dance, arts, oral tradition, and blood memory. The places we honor include the living spirit of Ogo Puagwe, as well as those who came before and who re remain present today. Welcome, I'm Rebecca Aubin. I'm the head of education at the New Mexico Museum of Art. And I proudly uh, introduce Mary Scully, curator, head, cur head of curatorial and curator of contemporary art and Kara Romero, artist and currently in the Alcoves exhibition at the New Mexico Museum of Art. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us today, especially Kara Romero. It is both an honor and a pleasure to welcome and introduce Kara uh, for today's virtual program. Romero is a distinguished artist who has received numerous awards at both the Heard Museum and Santa Fe Indian Markets. She also received, received the Distinguished Alumni Award from the Santa Fe-based Institute of American Indian Arts. Born in Inglewood, California, Kara Romero grew up splitting her time between urban Houston and the rural Chemehuevi Reservation in the Mojave Desert, of which she is an enrolled member. Her striking photographs reflect academic study, which began with cultural anthropology at the University of Houston, followed by fine art photography at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and later technical photography from Oklahoma State University. All of these are reflected in her gorgeous photographs that add to and diversify cultural narratives. She is broadening, broadening representation that is most often dominated by Eurocentric perspectives and in the process, combating exclusion and erasure. I look forward to discussing all of these as we dive into the program. Kara will present and discuss her work and hopefully share some of the projects she's working on in Southern California. After the artist's presentation, there'll be time for some discussion and questions and answers. I will keep my eye on the chat box, so please use both of those features. And then without further delay, <clears throat> I'm truly thrilled to introduce Kara Romero. Thank you, Kara, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mary and Rebecca. My name is Kara Romero, and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Chimwebi Indian Tribe of Southern California. I'm also a mother and an artist. Um, I am a contemporary uh, fine art photographer making work on the intersection of native identity and pop culture. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and walk through a little uh, autobiography and um, share about a little bit more about my work that is there. Um, let's see. So I can't see you anymore, but it, how does that look? Can you see that? That's perfect. And I love okay, those earrings. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, Mary did a wonderful job with my biography. I was born to interracial parents in the late 70s and uh, moved to the reservation with my entire family in 1979. Um, later on, my parents split. And so I spent most of my formative years going back and forth. Um, between the two sides of my family. Um, my Anglo side in, that was at that time had relocated from California to Houston. And then um, my father's side of the family on the Chimwevi Valley Indian Reservation in the heart of the Mojave Desert of California. Our tribe is along um, the California waterfront of the Colorado River and that's um, the desert landscape that you can see behind me on this uh, great Zoom backdrop. One of the things that I learned pretty early on um, going back and forth between cultures and two worlds was that most of mainstream America had very little understanding of what contemporary reservation was life was like. 
um, the diversity of the many um, Native North American tribes um, certainly didn't understand what it was to be a California desert native person. And so, you know, I just grew up with this very um, deep understanding of um, my reality and the family from where I hailed and the landscape from where I hailed from. And um, this really uh, distinct notion that people um, had no idea who we were as a people and as human beings. And so I think from a very early age, um, I wanted to tell um, a modern story of our beauty, our resilience, our humanity as Native peoples. And so um, this went all the way up and through um, my college experience as, you know, beginning as a cultural anthropology major at the University of Houston. Still, everything was taught as bygone, only in historical context and, you know, only with um, historical depictions of Native Americans and textbooks. And um, I simultaneously took my first black and white film class at the University of Houston and uh, had a wonderful instructor named Bill Thomas. I had never picked up a camera before, um, never picked up a, a real camera, I would say, before the age of about 20 years old. And um, he spent extra time with me, teaching me how to use the camera and use the settings, but he emphasized um, content over technical ability. And he was just one of those people that um, changed my life. And while I had a lot of catching up to do technically, um, I knew immediately that I had a lot to say. And so that was how I um, came into the love of photography. Um, and I did what 20 year olds do. And I ran off to art school, which is what brought me to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, in 1999, I enrolled at the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico and began um, an associate's uh, a, a, a journey to get my associate's degree in black and white film after leaving the university. Um, I was telling Mary earlier that um, I was just right at the crux, the transition of the photography industry. Um, so uh, we were in the fine art um, part of photography in 1999 and then into the early aughts, um, film was very important and digital had really not caught, caught up to film at that time. Um, it was from the fine art aspect of the industry uh, paled in comparison to film. And so um, there was this real tension between um, film artists and digital. Um, entrepreneurship of photography that was coming into play with um, journalism and uh, the fast, the quickness of digital. And, and so I found myself a little bit disillusioned after I finished school, not understanding exactly, you know, how I was going to do this, um, just making silver gelatin work. Um, and so I actually uh, decided um, I made a really difficult decision at the time to go back to school and attain a degree in photography technology um, from Oklahoma State University. So it was an applied science degree. It was um, both film, so large format, medium format, um, but it was also uh, emphasized um, all the different types of the photography industry. So editorial, um, commercial, product, um, executive portraits, um, uh, sophisticated lighting techniques for all of those um, different styles of photography. And then of course, digital and Photoshop and photo illustration. And most of that work, um, most of that course of study was about um, how they were going to produce commercial photography or photographers out of the program. And so just to share a little bit of my background, um, I think it's really those two uh, journeys for totally different types of photography that ended up kind of combining and um, lending themselves to uh, my voice that emerges with my style of photography today. 
So today I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, going through uh, the show that's up at the alcoves at the New Mexico Museum of Fine Art. I'm so honored to be in my very first alcove show um, there in downtown Santa Fe. And um, I had a wonderful time with Mary picking out the work that would go into this show. And she and I were very interested in um, highlighting the cultural landscape from where I'm from. So I do live there in Santa Fe and am married to Diego Romero, who is Cochiti Pueblo from just south of Santa Fe and a world renowned artist in his own right. And um, I still consider home the Mojave Desert. So the cultural landscape is something that definitely um, emerges in my work as a common theme. And this idea of cultural landscape is really about um, indigenous worldview of the place from which you emerge. And this idea of how as native people, we are truly inseparable from our landscape. Um, these ideas of reciprocity that we belong to the landscape um, and really rejecting these ideas of landscape as property, but more um, focusing on our original instructions of um, belonging to the landscape and respecting the landscape and understanding um, that we're all part of this ecosystem. And that is our responsibility as native peoples to um, protect uh, those landscapes from where uh, we emerge. Chimuevis are known for um, our uh, fine art basket weaving, um, some of the very finest in the Great Basin basket weavers. And so I, like many um, artists from my community, grew up um, learning these sophisticated uh, indigenous science techniques of um, gathering basket materials and weaving baskets. And we're known for the three rod um, form of baskets wrapped with um, white willow, sometimes called river willow, and devil's claw to make the dark design. Um, this idea of indigenous science is something um, that is still, you know, incredibly important to me as um, an artist, even though I'm working in a different medium. Um, these sophisticated sciences are uh, really um, indicative of the health of our ecosystems. Um, and so we look to uh, guide the health of our communities and our culture and our language um, through our traditional art forms. And um, that's something true, that's very true for uh, many of our communities that emerge from all kinds of different bioregions. So we are concentrating on um, the Mojave Desert and uh, this is the first image that does appear um, in the show at the New Mexico Museum of Fine Art. And this one is called For the Kahuya Boys. So um, this is uh, a time of evening, um, right at sunset, the beginning or dusk, if you will, uh, when uh, the Southern California singers begin to sing together. And um, I'll go to this um, image called Puha. We're known for um, bird singing in Southern California and Chimwebis are also known for our um, salt songs and they sing them with this gourd rattle um, and both the male and female um, sing together. Um, but bird songs specifically are social songs and um, they're sung intertribally. So it's very unique. Um, to Southern California that we sing these songs and um, we share them intertribally. So this uh, image is taken um, very near, uh, very specifically where my family is from, right on the border of California and Nevada, um, very near uh, Nipton, uh, California and Searchlight, Nevada um, is where my family is from. And this was taken uh, right at sunset. It is a composite image. So you can see um, this Joshua tree is so big. It's actually three um, photographs or negatives, if you will, stacked together um, to be able to fit the Joshua tree in this one um, gigantic image. So you can see uh, where the film separates in the middle and then again two thirds of the way up and then 
uh, at the very top of the image so that the entire Joshua tree fits in. Um, there's also vintage paper um, overlaid on the top of it, which is from my family's um, collection and a different night sky. Um, so that's where the stars are emerging in the image. So this is a use of photo illustration. Um, the silhouette is completely done in camera and then the different textures that you're seeing. Uh, this one is an outlier to um, some of my work. Um, it is very um, introspective. So I was pleased that Mary chose it and a few people have um, collected this piece over time. That always surprises me as well, the more introspective work. Um, I am known more for my work with um, human beings. And so I was touched um, that this piece uh, did so well with, um, you know, audience reception. And um, I just have such a love for this landscape. These little boys are from my community. This piece is not in the show, but I did want to just kind of relate uh, that idea of the bird songs of Southern California and a little bit more about where I'm from. And back to this idea of how we are inseparable from the landscape. Um, this is uh, called Yucca Woman. Um, and it is a silhouette taken next to the Choya cactus, which are also um, here behind me. They're very common to our landscape. Um, I think a lot of people think of the Mojave Desert as very barren. Um, and very empty, but it's actually the second most biodiverse landscape in the world behind the rainforests. And so it's really thriving um, with uh, all kinds of different life. Um, many of um, my pieces that come from the landscape that I'm from also carry with them um, sentimental ideas of our mythos or our you know, oral histories that have come along with us through the years. So um, Yucca Woman is, um, uh, I guess I would say like a, a demigoddess of our early um, stories, uh, our fabled stories. And um, like fables, they teach us our ways to live in relation with each other and with the landscape. Um, it actually features a young woman that I've worked with since she was very young. Her name is Sheridan Silversmith. And she'll show up in another um, photograph uh, that's in um, the show as well. I do typically work with my friends and family um, on different stories that we like to tell. Um, I would say that um, the use of the silhouette um, and the repeated pattern against um, the, the sunset sky kind of gives this um, image that feeling of how our spirit beings and how all of our stories that come with us um, are still in the landscape. And so kind of an apparition, if you will, um, that these people and ideas um, are very much in existence in our landscape. One of the things that I like to use is, or maybe a term that people are more familiar with, um, is this idea of magical realism. Um, so when things do look a little bit uh, otherworldly, it's this idea um, of indigenous worldview of the supernatural happening in everyday life or what outside cultures consider supernatural, but ways in which we experience um, the world around us. Um, and so you'll often see ideas of linear time um, being thrown out as well and these uh, ideas of magical realism that emerge in my work. So um, there's a little bit more uh, of the landscape that I'm from and four boys from the community um, that you'll see emerge in many pieces of my work. Um, they're growing up. So uh, the little boy, let's see, in the passenger side of the front of the Cadillac on this one, is that same little boy um, that's in the foreground of this photo and the same little guy that's um, third from the left in this photograph. Um, so just sharing a little bit about that. This next piece um, kind of gets into the next theme of my work as well. And that's this idea of how um, 
we uh, under are, are fully astute in pop culture and uh, mainstream America, as well as being um, very tied to our traditional cultures and our oral traditions and um, all of our cultural privacy simultaneously. So this is, um, of course, a direct reference to Abbey Road um, with the, the very famous Beatles Abbey Road poster, but this one is called the 17 Mile Road. And it's the same four little boys um, on our very long road into our reservation. Um, so a lot of tribes, uh, when reservations were withdrawn, were placed in you know really remote, really rural areas, as was our tribe. Um, and so this is a very um, iconic road to our our community. Everybody from our community knows um, this that this is the 17 mile road. And this piece was produced um, in uh, both as part of the Desert X Biennial as well as um, with the PBS Craft in America episode that Diego and I were a part of called Identity. So you could Google that and see um, the behind the scenes and making of this particular image. So um, this uh, journey to make more work that was very um, genuine to who I am and my identity um, was really wanting to get away from the stereotypical depictions of Native Americans that I grew up with. And while um, I love Curtis images, they captured the world's imagination so much um, that the people never really got past them. And so they became this documentation of the vanishing race and um, that was really, uh, you know, even up to 20 years ago when I started in photography, what um, the genre of Native American photography was still very much defined by. And so as I, um, you know, started out in photography, I would say a lot of us 20 years ago were emulating Curtis and we were making black and white um, images that were sepia toned, they were figurative landscapes. We extracted anything modern um, from the context of the photograph, kind of reinforcing this idea that we were mythical people from the past. And um, as I matured and became um, an artist that was very interested in um, examining um, truth and identity and in community, I really wanted to tell a different story. And um, so you can see that in some ways, this is called TV Indians is a response to um, Edward Curtis. So it is still a figurative landscape in traditional regalia in a New Mexico landscape. Um, but instead of taking out anything of modern context, it's um, placed in there very purposefully. Um, to reinforce um, the modernity of our community. And then this one, of course, has a whole another um, level of sociopolitical commentary about how we're portrayed um, in the media. And you can see um, from how we've been portrayed in the media over the last 75 years, the stark contrast between what we actually look like. So it becomes also um, very humorous and uh, people sometimes enjoy um, knowing what um, are on the TVs. So very quickly, um, there's Billy Jack, there's a uh, little big man, there's um, Iron Eyes Cody, who was not even Native American, um, Dances with Wolves, Thunderheart, Tonto and Lone Ranger, Smoke Signals, the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima, the occupation of Alcatraz and the detonation of um, the bomb there in New Mexico. And so this has been such a wonderful um, theme for me to work with as uh, an artist because um, instead of photography being used as a weapon, as an exploitive weapon against our community, always wanting to seek insight into our cultural privacy. Um, it's become a way to really assert to outside communities um, that we're fully, um, you know, 
uh, aware of biblical stories and of pop culture and that we're um, every bit as indigenous as we ever were while we um, thrive in both worlds. And um, I find those stories uh, much more um, also well received within my own community. So I would say I make artwork for my own community first. Um, and in keeping that uh, conversation very truthful with my peers and with my own native community, um, the stories um, become more genuine and more thoughtful. This one also belongs to the permanent collection at the New Mexico Museum of Fine Art. And that is uh, Coyote in the Middle, our beloved trickster, who um, often shows up to um, often shows up when mistakes are about to be made. And so we learn vicariously through his mistakes, but he also lends a lot of um, humanity to ourselves and to our ways of learning and being. And even though he always makes the wrong decisions, we love him anyways. And finally, um, as my last uh, theme that emerges in my work is this idea of a woman being um, behind the camera, a native woman. And I come from a tribe um, that has a, both a great amount of gender equity, as well as a lot of female leadership and strength. Um, our creation uh, story, um, our creator is female. And so all that to say, um, I really love to show the power and the strength of Native women. Um, and that is just uh, something that I've found um, really uh, sings through, you know, my way of working. This is Sheridan again, um, that was earlier portrayed as Yucca woman. And this is taken in a sacred area of white clay on my reservation. Um, and so, uh, again, this inseparableness from our landscape and um, in our traditional dress of Southern California in the bark skirt. Tie is also um, a piece in uh, the show at the New Mexico Museum of Fine Art Alcove show. And this was a very special piece um, to me that was created about the young woman that it portrays. Uh, most of these are named after the women that they portray, giving them agency. So, and also giving uh, the viewer insight that this one is called Sheridan because it's about Sheridan. Um, this one is very much about Ty. And uh, just quickly, a few um, really uh, things to think about when you're seeing this image is this is, you know, from uh, a classically trained photographic perspective. Um, nothing done in Photoshop. So that is an antique um, Navajo blanket um, placed behind her and lit. Um, I borrowed it from Shiprock Gallery there on the plaza. They were kind enough. I think it's circa 1920. Um, and this is Thai in the front, um, lit very beautifully. Uh, Leah Mata, a dear friend of mine and a celebrated regalia maker of Southern California, her and I um, strung um, the thousand or the hundreds of olivella shells that we draped around um, Ty's uh, neck um, as an homage to white shell woman of Diné culture and also reinvigorating this idea of pre-colonial um, trade routes between um, the peoples of Southern California into the desert and into the Southwest, which of, of course how they got their shells. And then finally, um, just wanted to share that I'm here um, in the center of uh, creation in Southern California. Many of our tribes believe that we emerge from the place of the ocean, um, which is Los Angeles. And I am working on a public art series here in LA to bring visibility to um, the tribes of Southern California. Um, I'll have some billboards go up at the beginning of August, and I'll be bringing back um, a new series of work um, that emerges from this landscape and these um, beautiful peoples of Southern California and the many stories um, that they have to share. So with that, I'll stop sharing and um, open it up. I hope I did okay on time.
Oh, you're muted, Mary. Sorry. Sorry about that. I was just saying you were amazing. You covered everything so comprehensively and it was so um, nice to see some of those new images. So some of the, is the new work all gonna be black and white? No, and I really, um, I, I don't decide on the color until the very end. Um, and that one that I showed may end up in color as well. It's an absolutely stunning sunset. Um, I just wanted to share a sneak preview. So I went ahead and edited it, edited it quickly. I can never say that. Well, I, I appreciate <laughs> the sneak peek. And um, <clears throat> the, the TV Indians, which is in our exhibition is the first time you've shown that in color as well, I believe. Yes. Yes. So that was, that's great. I mean, I'm so overwhelmed. I almost don't know what to talk about, which is people who know me know that's really un quite unusual. Um, but I do think it was interesting to that you talked about the one piece being a composite image, the last piece, a tie that you talked about being a very pretty straight commercial, um, not commercial, but, you know, just pretty straight photography. Um, yeah. The technical and the your technical facility is so important that um, I just th I think that maybe that's some of the reasons the images I don't know I, do you feel like the technical your understanding of the technical is what helps you get your your message out in a way that is um, that's really it's not so much easy to grasp but people see it and it feels familiar because it's so kind of right. And then you get to tell these more important stories that are kind of under, that are maybe under the radar. Uh, yeah. And actually, I guess that's because, like you said, it's it's clearly a female indigenous artist behind that lens. You know that your voice is so strong. Um, Thank and, you, Mary. And that's not usual. I think. Um, you know, photography is really so much about painting with light. And um, early on when I fell in love with it and, and that healthy compulsion about always wanting to get better. Um, you know, I don't think photographers are ever done pursuing, um, you know, new lighting techniques and new ways to capture ideas. But I do think um, one of the things that I've learned is that just like there's a psychology to color, in fine art, there's a psychology to lighting and photography, and you can um, evoke all types of things through a photograph. So for one, um, if you're trying to portray um, how contemporary we are as native peoples, how things are ever changing, but ever permanent, you know, the use of um, sophisticated lighting techniques became becomes really, um, such a useful tool of communication. And then, you know, I didn't know 20 years ago that photography would be so pervasive in our entire lives, right? Now I think we consume more photography than we do words. Um, yeah. And so there's like this, it's almost become a whole language, if you will. Um, and so I am really still exploring photography as a language, um, as a way to visually communicate a lot of our different stories. But yeah, capturing motion does something different than, you know, letting it blur by. Um, and then that idea, I, I feel very fortunate to have been trained in film at this point, because you said you were trained in film. And so there's this incredible emphasis on everything having to be done in camera, right? Right. Um, everything that can possibly be done in camera is done in camera because no amount of um, photo illustration or Photoshop can ever change what a photographer can do if they have the skills to do that in camera. And um, I think uh, all of those things combine to, you know, I, I feel like I, you know, have made it through all of this, you know, strange, difficult schooling, and I'm able to portray my community in um, just this way that's never been done from within the community. And I see a lot more artists emerging that um, kind of are on the same path. And that really excites me too, because we have yeah. a wealth of content and a wealth of beauty in our community. Well, and, uh, and establishing a counter narrative. I mean, it's, it's, I don't even like to say counter narrative, but uh, bringing forward a perspective 
that should be that is contemporary and part of the mainstream. That's really significant. You talked about beauty, resilience, and humanity in the images. And I thought, yeah, that's that's everything that's in there. Like I kept taking notes about, you know, like the figures, there's there's like this comfort and assertiveness, but none of those things really captured what I was seeing in terms of the 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 strength of the way you portray people. And even strength isn't the right word, but as soon as you said beauty, resilience, and humanity, I thought, yeah, that's exactly it. Those three, not that that's the only thing in there, but those three traits um, are what kind of give us a sense of, you know, Sheridan as Sheridan in that one image, but also your skill when she's Yucca woman, there is something that feels very connected to the land, but also very powerful and uh, knowledgeable. You know, they're the same person. And in some ways they both embody the same thing, but the, um, the story in those images or the impact of those images is just subtly different and that's skill. Thank you. So, um, so I, I can't believe I'm at a loss for words, which is never really something that happens to me. <laughs> um, but I wondered if you could make, so you talked a little bit about your project with the Indian Collective and that's a, a, a major grant. You were one of five or six people, I think, awarded these. Uh, ten. Ten. Oh, ten. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it seems as though your, your um, emphasis of your work in terms of showing your community as a living, vital, non-historical pro uh, set of people is really in keeping with their, um, with their motivation. But this project in California seems like a perfect way to really make very public that statement. And so. I was, yeah, just really, um, I was really, I think, humbled and excited um, to have been selected because I wrote a project um, really at the heart of my work since the beginning is um, wanting to bring visibility to uh, Southern California native peoples who have experienced um, a disproportionate amount of erasure in media and education. And um, one of the words that we use in Southern California is invisibility. Um, and then, you know, to layer on top of that, this idea that um, so many of the tribes along the coast and in some of the most expensive real estate, real estate uh, were never federally recognized. And all of um, the multiple issues that, you know, mainstream America really has no understanding of. Um, and simultaneous to that, you know, this idea that Native peoples just... Um, press on and continue on and they still have their cultures and they're still you know passing things down you know or up however you want to look at it you know against all odds you know and so really wanting to celebrate um, you know what's going on here in the community and uh, really giving them the visibility uh, through the Indian Collective so I was just incredibly honored that they selected this particular project I think you know, uh, Indian Collective is uh, a national native led philanthropic organization. Um, their tagline is to defend, develop and decolonize. And they're doing that through um, a multi uh, faceted approach um, and using art as one of the ways to do that and um, really addressing, uh, you know, ways to change you know, public opinion and public policy um, through visual communication and no better people to do it than native people to understand exactly what their community needs. And um, I was really delighted that that national um, uh, board selected a Southern California project. And I hope that that continues to be an emphasis across um, Indian country is to continue to support our brothers and sisters along the coast that don't have their federal recognition, um, that don't have land base, um, that uh, face a lot of um, struggles that we don't as federally recognized tribes. So. Great. That's um, really important work. I want to go back to something that you had said earlier about how 
we see so many more images now almost than we see words. So it's kind of how we, um, how we soak things in and how people learn. Um, but also the idea of starting in film and we're bombarded by so many images because I can keep 600 of them on my phone. I can shoot 10 <laughs> in a second on my phone or whatever. Uh, but do you, I wonder if maybe some of the combination of training with the with a camera where you have to spend time and you compose within the camera combined with some of the more digital stuff, digital training in terms of what you could do afterwards. Um, do you think it's kind of the, do you think that that time spent originally using more traditional materials um, it, it informs your work at all? Because it feels like it's it's so thoughtfully composed and um, yeah, you could manipulate all of it, but it wouldn't be the same if it was all if it was all illustration. Yeah, I um, I think for me, it's really critical um, that so much of it is captured in camera. And for me, the use of photo illustration has just kind of become a liberator in some ways. Um, and I didn't see that coming when I first started utilizing it. Uh, but it really just became a way um, to accentuate the storytelling, if you will. So like if I were to go back to some of the pieces that you're probably instantly familiar with, um, I would say, you know, Coyote Tales, number one, you know, I added in the stars into that sky, you know, um, I think it was like a smoky sky or it was overcast that day. And so I added those stars into that background and pumped up the red. And so it's like, it gives these ideas of like, oh, they're really painting the town red. And, you know, this is a coyote story at night and you don't look at the, like everything else done in camera is just, um, so everything's there, you're not seeing anything. And the other things just kind of like take you into your imagination, I think is, you know, um, a wonderful way to use photo illustration. I think um, there's no fooling the audience. Um, and so it just kind of stands, uh, it stands separate from um, images that are completely photo illustration um, and completely unrealistic. It really kind of, you know, sets you firmly in both worlds. And um, I think that that does make them kind of magical, even more magical, you know, is that they're really, you know, based so heavily in reality. I love it when people are like, how did you do that? Like other photographers will ask me that all the time. And, you know, really it's just going back to, you know, most of them are like the equivalent of a double negative in the dark room. You know, mm -hmm. if I had to like, I'd say there are two absolute um, distinct images, both done completely in camera. I could do most of what I do in photo illustration in the dark room. You know, I'm not um, doing too much more than that. So, yeah. No, well, they, uh, the, they're so striking. And when you talked about magic realism, I was like, yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's real, but there's something else going on kind of under the surface that's, uh, that's spectacular. And, Thank you. um, I feel like your family should be very comfortable now with that you're having gone back to school again for technical photography. Because <laughs> clearly, um, you know, it's expanded your voice and it's such an important voice and such an important uh, perspective that um, it is, uh, it's valued as a, a, you know, I personally value it as a woman and then I personally value it as part of a society where I get to see an alternative and it's not even, I get to see a narrative that's not the same perspective. It's not uh, European white male um, standard history. You know, it's, it's reality. The other thing that's interesting, and I don't know if that's because I'm in New Mexico now, is it's so nice to see a coastal and a, and a desert scene that's not, um, not that I don't like images of Pueblos or those kinds of things, but to place these figures in the, in the landscape that's theirs, but is not necessarily how we're, they're typically seen, you know? No, I mean, I but, don't, that's yeah, just me, still but <clears throat> sister tribes from, um, from long ago. Yes. I'm, uh, so honored to live on Pueblo lands as well and bring, um, bring my community with me here that I think, yeah 
um, there have been a few of us coming out here to visit and live probably for thousands of years and, <laughs> and that way. So, yeah, I mean, but it's just, a, I think it's just that different scenery and also the discussion of the biodiversity of that, which is like you said, it's often seen as, as just desolate land with no life, but um, that's quite diverse. So, yeah. Well, um, I think I'm going to tie this up and thank you so much for your presentation. It was great to learn about you personally, as well as about your work. And I'm excited to see your completed project in California. Thank you so much for inviting me and to all of the attendees today for um, taking time out of your schedule to join us. Great, thanks. Okay. And then I'm gonna put a little pitch in for June 16th, JC Gonzo and Marietta Patricia Lees, who are also Alcove 2020 artists, will be having a conversation too. So please join us then on the 16th at 1.30 Mountain Time. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. And everyone behind the scenes too, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs>